to have uh, Coach Greg Quick with us tonight from the Montreal Alouettes. Uh, Coach Quick has been coaching at all levels, um, and he's been at the small college level. He knows how it is to not have all the talent around you and, and stuff to be able to build things up. So it, you know, it's always it's nice when you talk to the coaches that have been through all the levels because they, they they have probably a better understanding of what it takes to really build players up and uh, get the best out of them. Uh, some guys start at the top and they don't really know about having to deal with guys that don't necessarily move the best and all that stuff. So um, so I'm excited to have Coach Greg Quick talk tonight. And you got it, Coach. Take it away. Good evening, guys. Hope you're all uh, all doing well. And I want to take thanks, Sharbs. You know, these last couple of years have been hard. You know, we always want to talk, talk ball. And I appreciate, you know, he's done a great job with these clinics uh, over time. And uh, we really appreciate that. You know, Sharbs, I really do appreciate it. But I'll tell you, I've been up here in my office doing uh, virtual everything for the last couple of years. So uh, we're going to take a vote. But I, I'm telling you, this is what we got to do. Um, it's very important, I think, that in 2023, we have the non-virtual football clinic. And uh, we're able to meet somewhere, have a beer afterwards, draw on a napkin, and talk ball. So I'm, uh, I think that we continue this, but then I think we have a capstone opportunity where we can uh, get together in a non-virtual environment. Uh, you know, you can pull somebody out of the audience, you can demonstrate a little bit, and uh, you can move forward. So I'm going to make the motion that uh, sometime in 2023, we all get together uh, face to face and have a great clinic, all right? Tonight, performance ingredients, making the intangible tangible. You know, the first thing I'm gonna tell you tonight is, you know, I tell my guys, first time I walk in a room is I'm gonna try and stay away from as much coach speak as I can. And if you think I'm talking coach speak, I want you to call bullshit on it. But I'm gonna try and make every attempt tonight through what I present with to show you that this isn't just coach talk. Because when you start talking about the intangibles, many times the mental, the character, the intellectual components of the game, um, it starts to get away from you. So I'm gonna, that I, I pulled from several different resources, things so you can see, these are things that, you know, my professional uh, proficiency is dependent upon the intangibles. I have built, uh, this will be my 42nd year coaching, and I have built my career, the persistence, the sustainability of my career is built on my professional proficiency, which is built on these intangibles. I think everybody is going to develop the tangibles. It's those of us able to develop the intangible components of both our players and ourselves that are going to be able to have a sustainable career. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm thankful for Kahari and Danny and all the guys on the staff, uh, Baron Miles, our defensive coordinator, for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Uh, so I represent Mr. Stern. I re represent Mario, our president, and everybody in our organization. And I'm really excited to be here tonight and represent the Montreal Alouettes. We're excited about where we're at. And we're excited about where we're going. I also need to thank the Pacific Institute. Uh, Greg Coughlin, who's the CEO and president of the Pacific Institute, is a friend of mine, and we've had many, many discussions. I'm going to share with you some of the things we've talked about in the past, uh, and, you know, they do a great job. They've worked with Alabama, the Seahawks uh, in Canada. They've worked with the NHL. They've worked with the uh, the Olympics, especially the dog or the down, the uh, bobsled teams. So, um I really thank for the part of the talk tonight that comes from the Pacific Institute. And then Pigskin Power is myself and my son, our, our effort to help offer, share our wisdom, both with players, coaches, and leaders. Uh, and at the end, uh, I will, I've already given you my email. I've also given a website address. So feel free to reach out anytime that we could be helpful. On March 12th, here in Saginaw, Michigan, we're having an OTA, an optimal training activity for linebackers and D linemen. If anybody uh, has any players of any age from youth through, uh, you know, aspiring pros, we'd love to have them. So, fellas, let's get started here. First thing I want to show you tonight, this comes, 
uh, uh, Sherry, th there's a few slides that come directly from the Pacific Institute and Greg Coglin and his preparations and when he's visiting with some of the teams that we talked about. One of the things that I think is, is really hard is just what this slide uh, alludes to. One is potential. We all have potential. Our players have potential. Organizations, teams have potential. But the hard part, <clears throat> excuse me, is achievement. It's not what can they do, but what do they actually do? Not their learns, not the skills they have, but their real performance. Because really, as coaches, that's what we're trying to do. And that tonight, I want to talk about performance ingredients, those things that help our players achieve. Now, what stands in the way between potential and achievement? Habits, attitudes, beliefs, expectations. Those are the intangibles I'm talking about. You have the skill, you have the physical abilities, but how do you get to achievement? What stands in the way are, the, are those intangibles of habits, attitudes, beliefs, expectations? Now, what do we do? How do we start to eliminate those constraints? those invisible, those intangible constraints that help, that really hinder us and don't allow us to move from potential to achievement. I believe the first thing we have to do in our programs is establish standards. Now, these slides that are in this format are actually taken from interview preparation for, uh, for employment. Uh, these are slides that I actually used in an interview. So I'm, I'm telling you that I believe enough in what I'm talking about here that I'm putting my career on the line and I support my career. And as I've said, it's driven it for 42 years. So these standards and these, these things I'm going to talk about that are in these slides have helped me continue and sustain my career. But standards are the things that are going to help us eliminate those intangibles that stand in our way. And I think standards are 360 degrees, all aspects of our program, all aspects of our room, all aspects of our position, all aspects in our own coaching lives. We have to have goals, visionary goals that are driven by strategic and tactical behavior objectives. Now, I know many of you are educators. Back in the day when, when we learned about lesson plans and being an educator is all about behavioral objectives. And I often go back to this, and basically what a behavioral objective says is that through participation in this or by participating in this drill, an athlete that participates in this drill will achieve this. There should be an outcome. There should be a behavioral objective for everything we do. So if there is an objective and it is driven by those goals, and it's both strategic and tactical, then it's going to help us eliminate those intangibles. So the standards in our programs are going to help us erase those intangibles, those invisible constraints to us achieving. So there are five performance ingredients that I'm going to talk to you about that I think are important that we always have to address uh, as whether we're evaluating, we're teaching, we're coaching, we're reevaluating, and then we're continue to rep until we have achievement. But these are the ingredients that are important. The physical and the skill, we're all familiar with those. The physical and the skill, that's what you can do. That's what you have. Now, the intellectual, the mental, and the character, those are the things that stand in the way before, between from our the potential of what we have physically and our skill set and our craft, what stands in the way from those leading to achievement are the intellectual, the mental, and the character. And those are really the things that I'm going to talk to you about tonight and show how we can make them tangible, how we can erase them so that our skill set and our physical abilities are not held back. So next, first, physical. When I talk, these are some of the things we're talking about. Balance, I think, is so important. I think it's neglected. I think you really need to look at each position group and what components of balance, how, how is balance important to them? You know, I don't care if it's a running back, a defensive lineman. If it's a running back on a flat cut or a jump cut, if it's a defensive lineman who's going in and out, 
his balance is so important. <clears throat> so how do we work balance, hip mobility in everything in athletics? I think it's, again, one of those things we take for granted. We all talk about it. Start power. I think we all work on get off. You know, there's two kinds of drills. There are closed drills and open drills. Open drills are what we really want to have. As many as we can within a, within a practice, within an individual period, reactive power is our ability to react, our ability to take some type of cue and then react to it, whether it's a visual cue, an auditory cue, take it and then reestablish and deliver power reactive to that cue. And I think that's those open drills where we have to react and perform the skill, react, establish a tactical advantage. Those are the things that we really need to focus on as much as we can, rather than closed drills that are just repetitive uh, steps within a skill. I think they need to be reactive, obviously dynamic movements and then the positional attributes. But for me, balance and reactive power are two things physically that we have to make sure that we focus on and we involve continually in the drills that we develop in our practice plans what we're doing uh, in drills, even unit drills or position to position, <clears throat> excuse me, let's make sure that we have the chance to, to work the reactive power component to that. Our skills, uh, one, everybody, we have, there are universal techniques. We have to do an inventory of what we believe the universal techniques in football are. Are those stance and steps? You know, the most undercoach component of football are the simple components of stance and steps. Everybody, we need to look at stance and step, make sure we uh, have the best uh, kinesiology, the best application uh, of our body to be able to use those universal techniques. So what are those techniques? We need to identify those and make sure we work those throughout our practice plan. Positional proficiency, you know, what do we, again, we need to do an inventory of what skills do we need to have proficiency in our position. The, then the, the big one is this, and I'll talk later about flow states and those types of things, but it comes back to this. Not only can we do those universal techniques in a teaching environment, can we not only have proficiency with those positional skills in that drill environment, but now under pressure. How can we create pressure within our practice so it's gonna carry over to the game, that pressure performance? Can we take our skills, both positionally and universally, and put them into pressure performance within a practice and a game? If we can, that's gonna to lead to impact plays. You know, there's a lot of guys that can do these, the, the common universal techniques. They can even master the proficiency of the position. But you know, they may be under pressure, they don't perform as well, or <clears throat> within the structure of the game, you don't get the impact plays. You're not getting those disruptions, especially when we talk about defense. We want those disruptions on defense. We want explosions on offense. A lot of players have those universal skills. They have positional proficiency but they're not disruptive, nor do they have the explosive uh, plays that we need to have. Intellectual, now we're starting to get in, okay, intuition, assignment execution, competitive awareness, and most importantly, how do our kids process? Are they able to take a correlation uh, between correlation and causation? If this happens, then there's a correlation to this should happen. Or if that happened, how does it cause this correlation to happen? That awareness, the competitive awareness within the game, knowing situationally what you need to do. Those are all really important. And then intuition, I'll talk a little bit more on later, but intuition is so important. Wisdom is like a living intuition. It's what you, the wisdom you have is brought to life through, through intuition. So important, so important. Now, I'm going to share with you this thought. You know, the, the uh, L.A. Chargers, uh, they weren't in the Super Bowl. And they had, you know, they knew assignments. 
I even think they were competitively aware. And I know that young coach, he can process, he understands correlation and causation. But he took the numbers so far that he did not allow the wisdom of the game that he's been able to acquire, he did not allow that to be used. He did not allow his intuition to come into play. So when it got into those pressure situations, the opportunity to have impact plays, <clears throat> he denied it because he allowed the numbers to overshadow what he knew intuitively and what his wisdom was telling us. So it's so important for us not to get so locked in that we don't allow our initial, our uh, intuition to, to blossom. Very important. Mental, self-talk, obviously, what's that little guy on his shoulder telling you? What's he saying to you? That's the most important person. Is that little guy on the shoulder, what he's saying to you? So your self-talk. Efficacy is your buy-in, visualization, affirmation. Just like self-talk, it's an affirmation. You need to affirm the fact that you're doing the right thing. You have the ability to do it. Obviously, goals, you stress, you stress is the right level of stress. The level of stress that's going to allow you to perform at the highest level. And then obviously, focus and force. The force is your ability to take your skills and your physical presence and mentally apply that force to the contest. So these are really important. I know I'm going fast here because I want to get ahead to some things that I think uh, are going to be meaningful for you. Character, I think we all know character is important, but not just the judo Christian right and wrong. You know, we uh, passion is part of character. Poise is part, you know, that grace under fire perspective does your player what what's their perspective is it i or is it we is it me or is it you is it us you know is it the team is it my teammate what perspective but i think the most important is principle and principles are sometimes hidden i want to share with you real quick a story i had a had a linebacker uh several years ago in montreal was a two-time captain at USC. That's right, two-time captain at USC. And I asked this question. I was looking at principle and how I could help uh, develop these character traits. And I wanted to check principle. So I asked the guys in the room, I said, hey guys, you go to the ATM and you're gonna pull out $100. You grab it and you look and instead of $100, you have $1,000. What are you going to do? The room went silent. I could tell they were all. So I asked the young man I was talking about, two-time captain at, uh, at USC. I said, what are you going to do with that $1,000? He says, coach, I'm going to wire it home to my mom and my little brother first thing. First thing. <clears throat> he wasn't going back in the bank to give it in. Or it, he wasn't, it wasn't the right or wrong as we may look at it from a judo-Christian standpoint. But this man had principles. He knew he was responsible. And if he was ever given a dollar more than he needed, it was going to his, his mom and his uh, little brother. To me, that guy has principles. We may need to work on what's right and wrong, but I'll tell you what, there's a reason that guy was a captain twice at USC. It was a, it was a solid teammate because of his principles. He was going to take care of the people that were entrusted to him. Okay, so we talked about the physical skill, and physical and skill, which obviously the body, our intelligence in the middle of the mind, and character wraps and locks all this together. Without character, the four other attributes fall apart. Character is what holds it all together. Without character, we're not going to be able to achieve. So one of those inv invisible components between the skill and achievement is our character. And to me, that's a big stumbling block. If you don't have the character, you're never going to get the level of achievement that you want to have. Okay, so this right here is a screenshot. When I was the director of global scouting for the CFL, this was the actual screenshot of an evaluation on a player. And it happens to be a player that we draft, ended up drafting in Montreal. Now, if you look at the dynamic movement, the dynamic force, the speed, the agility, the power, and the strength 
are very tangible. These actually, I developed standards off of five yard of five years in the CFL. I took the combine uh, times, distances, speeds over five years, and established a median. Not and so that it wasn't a matter of an average; it's a median. So the fifty percent means fifty percent of the people in the CFL would have been above that time. If you're at fifty percent. 50% would be below that time. So, for example, this young man in the 40 is at the 70th percentile, which means 30% of the guys over five years that have been in the combine would have been faster than him, and 70% would have been slower than him. Now, in the agility, he was at 100%. He was a, he agile guy. He can stop and start. Power was the vert. So again, 70% of the guys couldn't vertical as high as he did over the last five years. Bench, he was right in the middle of 50%. Now, you start to take the skill, and these are more objective as far as, you know, my evaluation. I, the one thing I want to hit on real quick over here to the right is, right over here is this VDA. To me, this is the most one of the most important things that we can begin to coach Vision, decision, and action. Can you see it? Can you make a decision off what you see? And what action do you take? That goes back, <clears throat> excuse me, to those open drills, to that reactive power. That's what VDA is. It's allowing us to take what we see, transfer it to us in our brain, make a decision, and then act and do that all under pressure. So obviously this young man was good at that. Then I have, I, I had interviewed him, so I had graded his, his mindset, his efficacy, he understood his role. But let me jump ahead. So when all that averaged out, he, his grade was 68. And if I look over here, a 68 puts you in yellow, which means he's a special teams player and he stretches the roster. Well, we ended up drafting this young man, and this year he, he dressed in six games before getting injured. But he came in after we lost a player who got injured. He had the same skill set, so we put him in. So he stretched the roster for us, and he played on four special teams in six games and performed really well. So we're able to take that intangible of that evaluation, and our evaluation put us right where we wanted to be. We, we, we signed this kid with the expectation of him being a special teams player that was going to stretch our roster, and that's exactly what he did. Now, performance. There, we always we're organized to avoid deviance. But what that means is this: we're always working in the middle between those two lines. We're working in the middle here for normalcy. Everybody works for normalcy. Our job as coaches is to move every anybody that's a negative deviance being. They deviate from the norm to in a negative direction. Obviously, is to raise them up. But really, how do we win championships? How do we get to an achievement level that's noteworthy? We got to move people into a positive deviance to pass. So how do we get them there? What's important is this. So if we look at the middle index, if we think about an achievement, those things that stand between our skill set in our achievement, we know there are those intent, the mental component is going to stop us. So if, when I grade things in a minute, you're going to see me grade a one is a, is a negative deviance. Three is a positive. Two's in the middle, right? We all want guys that are goal-driven. They have strong strength. They're persistent. They're resilient. They face challenges. Those are the guys. Yeah, that's we want everybody in our team to be there. But that's not enough. For us to get that, that's going to keep us, if <clears throat> that's only as far as we can go, excuse me. That's as far as we can go. We're never going to get to elite achievement. We got to get into a zone, into the flow. We got to have a level of confidence. We got to be focused. We got to be engaged. We got to be fearless. We got to be flourishing. That's where we want our players to be over in three. If we can move into a positive deviance, we get away from normal. Who wouldn't want to have goal-driven, strong, persistent, resilient, challenged kids, players? We all do. 
But if we're going to have the level of success that we want to have, if we want to be beyond normal as a coach, these are the things over here, the flow, getting our players to, to enter a flow state, to be confident, focused, engaged, fearless, then they'll flourish. That's what's important. So we'll talk a little bit about how do we get there? Well, everybody talks about flow. And this graph is really good, I think. So the bottom is skill level. To the side is the challenge. So obviously, if I have a low skill level down here to, at the bottom to the left, and up here to the left is a high challenge level, very tough, tough job, high skill. And if I have, you know, high challenge, if I have a low skill against a high, we're going to be anxious. We're not going to be able to perform. And even at a moderate level, if I have low skill, I'm going to worry, right? I'm not going to be able to, uh, to handle the pressure. And what's what's really here, – here? this to me is the interesting part. Low challenge, low skill. You'd think that person would be motivated. They're not. They become apathetic because they know that the skill is low, the challenge is low, and even though it's low, they don't have any ability to overcome. So they become apathetic. There's no hope. For me, apathy is the lack of hope. So if you have a low skill level and a low challenge, so we need to challenge our players. We need to force them into here if they have to. But at the same time, we do improve their skill level. So we need to make them more reactive. We need to make sure that we're maximizing all of their skill set. They're, get, they're gaining uh, improvement in their craft. Even if we get to a moderate level here, as the challenge level goes up, they're going to be in an arousal state. They're going to be able to handle that. They're going to be able to compete. Now, we have to raise that challenge to them when we practice. Thus, the, the reactive type drills, the open drills are very important. Otherwise, a moderate level skill set, they're going to get bored. And we're not going to get them even up to an arouse. We're going to need to raise the challenge to get there. Obviously, we have high skill set, high challenge. We're going to a flow state. But we know for sure, at least if we're in a moderate challenge, they're going to have control of this situation. They're going to be able to achieve. So we're really trying to move into this right past this average skill level over here into that positive deviance. To get that positive deviance, we need them to enter that flow state. We'll talk about that. Because really, success is about that. So here, right now, these are some actual covers to tip sheets from the 2021 season. So I'm not BSing you. This isn't coach talk. I believe so much every day for we talk about the components of either intellectual, mental, or character. We even dealt with power animals. The guy said, I am an owl. An owl because I'm wise, but watch out. If he comes flying down out of that tree with his, his uh, <clears throat> claws bared, you better watch out. So Coach Quick was an owl, but we looked at power animals. We talk about force. We talk about flow. Use stress, we mentioned a while ago. Intuition is so important. So these are all actual uh, covers to my tip sheets. Now, here's one I'd like to look at, flow, because it's we talked about that upper right. It's that consistency of excellence that we want to achieve. To me, what is a professional? A profession, if you're a pro, you have consistency of excellence. I tell my guys, it's no different than a doctor, a lawyer, a cop. If I go to a doctor and he performs surgery and I'm in the, the recovery room afterwards, I don't want the doctor to walk in and say, my bad. Right. I don't want that to happen. I want his consistency of excellence to be there every single time. We need the same out of our athletes. How do we get them in the flow state? What's important? So remember, this game here is against Ottawa. So can we get into a flow state? Remember this uh, wave here. Put that in your mind. Look at it for a second. Put it in your mind because this is going to be important in my next analogy. So here's some of the things we talked about. But this is was the important part. It goes back to that surfing picture. If you want to achieve more, think like a surfer. Surfing is a thousand-year-old sport. 25 years ago, the biggest wave was 25 feet. Now they get on jet skis and they get pulled into waves that are over 100 foot feet tall. 
where snowboarding in 1992, the biggest gap was 40 feet. Today, they go over 250 feet. It all has to do with flow and getting to that state. Everybody's happy with three or four, right, sacks in a game. In this football game, when we're talking about flow and how to get to a flow state, our defense had 10 sacks in this football game. Didn't have four or five, which everybody thinks is great. They were like that surfer. They didn't go for the the 25-foot wave. They got a 100-foot wave. Why? Because they opened their mind. They were able to process. They were able to handle the pressure and react. They didn't allow those intangibles to stand between. Obviously, they got the skills. They got the physical ability. But to achieve at the highest level, they had to break through those intangibles. So week after week after week, we chip away at those intangibles till they get to a point, they get to a flow state as a defense that allowed them, D-line, linebackers, DBs, coverage and rush to achieve 10 sacks. I don't think it's, it's just happens there. I think there's a reason those things happen. You got to coach them, you got to work on it. The atmosphere around you can trick. So like a wave, the complexity, no two waves are the same, right? You should vary your routine. I tell my guys, brush your teeth with the wrong hand. Instead of walking into the room, walk backwards into the room. So here's an example. When you're doing drills and everybody does uh, the speed ladder, right? First of all, you may want to go to uh, Pigskin uh, uh, on YouTube because on YouTube, I have a video where I show the similarity between using a, a speed ladder and river dance. They're very similar, the same movements. River dance isn't real applicable to football. Therefore, I don't think the speed at ladder is often. But one of the things we can do is I have them hopscotch. First time I ask them to hopscotch, they're like, what? What are you doing talking about, coach? They think Quick's really lost it. But they haven't done that for many of them in their drills. They've done the same thing in those speed ladders for years. Hopscotch is something different. It makes them change. It changes their whole perspective. They got to concentrate. It's a pressure situation. Left, right, left, right. Two, right, two, left, two, right, two, left. They do the hopscotch, but they have to concentrate. It's a pressure moment. It helps us get into a flow state later on. Okay, the last thing is we all have cues. We all have routines. I try and work with my guys in developing pregame routines. Really important. This one is short as this. This guy used to listen to music before every game. He put his earbuds in, he listened to the music. One day, he's sitting by his, he's sitting there bobbing his head. And you know what? He put the earbuds in, but he hadn't turned the music on. And actually, it was the earbuds that triggered his flow. So the, the, the regimen that we have pre-game or pre-practice can really impact our ability to, to achieve, to go from skills to achieve, to overcome those uh, intangible constraints we took, talked about in that first slide. Kaizen. Kaizen is a Japanese word. It comes from right after World War II. It means significant, significant continual improvement. In Japan, after the bombings, they had to clear away all the bricks. And after that first brick was removed, they celebrated. After one block was cleared of the bricks, they celebrated. After a city was cleared, they celebrated. After the first skyscraper went up, they celebrated. It was about significant and continual improvement. The answer to every question is, has to be, how do we get better? I told you this came from an interview. So my comment to the people interviewing me was this. Everything we do, the answer to every question that I'm going to have is how do we get better? So I want to share this with you. You guys may recognize some of these guys. You may not. This was my room last year. This was my room. Great group of guys. Not all common names in every household in Canada, but these guys, along with Chris Ackie, along with uh, Patrick Levels, along with Monty Hunter, these guys and the coverage on the back end led the CFL in sacks. Why? Growth mindset. 
We sat down and we went through character. We went through the mental. We went through the intellectual. They had an inventory of all those skills, of all those intangibles at the inventory. When I asked them to a man, what is it? What's our secret? What's important? And they said a growth that's their growth mindset. Basically this, that every day, the answer is, how do we get better? The answer to every question is, how do we get better? So when we watch film, how are we going to get better? How do we get better on this, on this pull play? How do we get better on this pass set? How do we get better? Growth mindset was the secret to these guys and their teammates achieving a very high level of success, reach, reaching that true flow state because of their growth mindset. That's why we talk about their growth mindset. It erased those constraints between skill and achievement. I want to show you this real. This is an actual end of the season assessment of linebackers from a few years ago. You can see the physical, the, the uh, five ingredients on the left. You can look across. <coughs> They're graded one, two, or three. One, negative deviance. They're not to normal. Two is normal. Three is a positive deviance. They're getting to the point where we can achieve at a high level. This uh, 2.4 right here. This person was a uh, East All-Star. He was a defensive MOP and uh, was a great player. Uh, had uh, about 100 and <clears throat> over 100 tackles this season. But if I look down here, he's good at everything. He's a normal or into a positive deviance in every area but one. Right here, pressure performance. How could a guy, defensive MVP, the MOP of the East Division, how can that MOP not have pressure performance? I'll tell you. Here's what it came down to. Remember the answer to the question, to every question is, how do we get better? When I answer, after the 2016 season, that's when this was, I said, how, does, how do I get this MOP better? What I identified is pressure performance. In the last three minutes of the game, he fell apart. There is a video of this guy making the most untalented play ever in the final seconds of a game, cost it, but it was terrible. And he's one of the most gifted athletes on the field, one of the best defensive players to play in the CFL. But in that pressure moment, he was below normal. When the ball got inside the seven-yard line, he tried to do so much that that's when he made mistakes. So what did we do to change, to help rate? How, did, how does he get better? How do we answer that question? It's how we coached him in the pressure situation. So the next year, three-minute drill. We talked. We watched film. We explained what his role was, both in three-minute and goal line, what his role was, what he needed to do, his obligation, his responsibility to the defense. That was the answer to that question. How does he get better? Pressure performance. We write prescriptions for our players. So you talk about dynamic force. That's ability to change things, to put his physical force in the game. So for him, he needs to continue to play with force for entire contest. In other words, we need to raise our level of conditioning a little bit. So I need to make sure we address that practice. Um, so if you look at four on technique, elevated, he was a good tackler. What I found out is if you take the opportunities to tackle, the tackles made and the missed tackles, and 85% or above is an all-star player in the CFL. Below 85% should not be an, is not an all-star player. So for him to be, he was good. He was 85, 86, 87%. But he needed to elevate his tackling from good to historic, to positive deviance. So to get to that point, we continue to work tackling. Now we did tackling and more reactive drills. We used tackling and more difficult, more balance. We'd eliminate balance. I'd put him in an unbalanced position and make him tackle so he could go. And he went from about 86, 87, up to 94, 95% in his tackling. But that was how we identified the question again. The answer to every question is how do we get better? All right, for us as coaches, on this last slide here, 
we have coaches, managers, leaders, innovators. So obviously coach is coaching and developing players. He's installing and executing X's and O's. Where we want to, the middle line again is developed, right? That's normal. The normal person is installing. You're, uh, you're working on culture and leadership. We all do that, right? That's, that's where we want everybody, our staff to be. That's where we want to be as coaches. But for us to achieve, to, the, we have to eliminate again those refining, those, those intangibles that keep our skill from achieving. So we want to get into that positive deviance. So now we have to look at the ecosystem. We have to look at the people, the culture, and the leadership. We got to look at innovation. How do we take those performance ingredients and create a progression, a teaching progression, just like those tip sheets that take us from, from normal? They were motivated guys, but they weren't in a flow state all the time. How do we go from normal to 10 sacks in a football game to leading the CFL in tackles? How does that happen? There was a performance progression aimed at those performance ingredients. That's what we, we have to be innovators. Every one of us on this call needs to be an innovator. Very important. I think I've used most of my time, but I think it's so important for us as coaches. We always, we need to work those skills. Make sure we're working those reactive skills. We have continue to develop the physical components. That 75% of achievement, man, is, is locked into skill and the physical. That other 25%, those are the intangibles that stand in the way of the championship achievement we want to have. If we do not address those intangibles in some type of progressive form, we'll never have the level of achievement that we'd like to have. I sent out <clears throat> my email. I sent out. Uh, so here's my Alouette's email. My personal website uh, is there, coachgregquick.com. On there, uh, it talks about. The, uh, the OTA we got coming up for linebackers and D linemen here in Saginaw. We'd love to have guys from all over the country come. It's for all ages, levels, uh, aspiring pros, high school, college, uh, youth, all levels. If you're looking for some videos, I have some videos on pigskin power on YouTube. Help yourself. You can actually use that QR. How do you like that, Paul? I got a QR code. On my website here to take me right to my website. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you guys, one of the things you need to do, I just told you, I've been in this business 42 years. When I started, we're still using film. We did cut-ups. Yeah, we cut the film and glued them together. But we started with uh, cards, and that stack of cards, those punch cards, is what we started with to do our breakdowns to where we're at today in digital. But I'll tell you what. I try and be everywhere I'm at. I try to be as good or better as anybody on that staff when it comes to the technology. Because normally when the old guy walks in a room, they think he is uh, technology poor, that he's handicapped. I'm not going to allow that to happen. So I understand for me to progress, for my professional proficiency, I have to maintain a standard uh, that we talked about earlier, that standard, I need to understand how that I can use technology to better and to sell and to use and create these intangibles being tangible. So I, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate the opportunity, Paul. If I can ever help any of you, please reach out, guys. And uh, let's be committed in 2023 to having a non-virtual clinic. Have a good night, guys. Awesome. Thanks, Coach Quick. Guys, if you have any questions, just go ahead and unmute yourselves and ask away. Uh, one thing uh, with Coach Quick, we had our offices were right beside each other in Montreal. And it, that man, he, he runs the numbers all the time. He's very analytical like that. Uh, so I, I, I knew with him throwing together a presentation like this, it would be very in-depth in terms of the analysis of the players and stuff. And it's, re it's really why the CFL hired him to go around the world and try and find these global players. So uh, the man is, he is on, on tune with how to do things and stuff. It's, it's amazing. So, so if you have a question, guys, just go ahead and unmute and, uh, and ask away. And I'll share the, uh, the YouTube uh, uh, channel on, uh, on the Facebook group too, coach. Good. Thank you. I appreciate it guys. Uh, th one quick question. Uh, thanks, Coach. Um, 
just doing those uh, VDA assessments, uh, can you think of like one quick drill or what, how would you assess VDA quickly in like a, a camp if you're in Germany evaluating players? Well, well, by instruction, one, right? And how they react uh, when they see, you know, walk up. So, for example, we didn't use a uh, vertex to do the vertical, right? So we used a, a pressure mat. And so for a lot of these guys, they have never done that, right? So what, it, how they could see, but how they could process at the same time, Sheldon, it was important to know that they could follow directions and do it. Because not only was it how high, reality, I wanted to see the video. I wanted to see if they could give me triple extension, right? Because if they get triple extension, then I know they're going to be able to tackle. They're going to be able to block. They're going to be able to elevate and do those things. So I re actually, it was the removal of the visual and making it more a, uh, a visualization of what they were doing that allowed me to judge whether they could process. And because a lot of times, Sheldon, there were language differences, right? I go to Japan and the language could be a problem. So I needed to be able to tell uh, you know, Berkey that, hey, this guy from Japan, he's got all these skills, but you you have to have somebody in the room that's going to be able to help him decipher what's going on. So, um, but for me in drills, Sean, it's as simple as, as a linebacker, add a back to the drill, right? Make them see the uh, backfield action, make them see the pull, you know, so I'm, I'm there and I have the pull and I've got to react and then I got to establish my block control rather than just working block control. Let's have a reaction with a pull player and then having to handle the, you know, am I spelling? Am I boxing it? How do I react to that? So always adding the visual simple as a D lineman rushing and then you're pointing right and left and they got to break off of that. Right. But any kind of visual, the other I like to do in tackling is everybody, <clears throat> you know, shuffles over the bags, and then they have to go tackle. I had a running back, a rabbit down there, and that rabbit goes side to side to side, and then will burst. So their shuffle is determined by following the back, maintaining leverage on the back. And then when that back bursts to a point, they've got to hit the cutoff and, and hit at the proper angle with leverage. So always trying to add a visual component, reactive component to the drills creatively. Hope that answers your question, buddy. Perfect. Thank you. And with all this great weather, we have a chance to, ourselves as coaches to look at, you know, the performance ingredients like you were talking about and how we're helping the guys with their physical, their skills, their intellectual, all that stuff, you know, how we're helping them during the season with our drills, how we're teaching things. You know, those are all things we can assess right now. Uh, I think that's all great stuff, coach. Nobody else. Well, I appreciate you jumping on, Coach Quick. Great presentation. Yeah.